Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 30th of April 2021. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robert Barwick. Welcome. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, Liberal Liars Under Fire in Australia Post Hearing and Why Scott Morrison Loves China's Belt and Road. So, firstly today, Liberal Liars Under Fire in Australia Post Hearing. The second round of hearings uh, held by the Senate Committee investigating the uh, standing down of Christine Holgate and associated events got very fiery on Tuesday and in fact the fights that ensued were rather emblematic of Australian politics as a whole at the moment because they were characterised by our role, the Citizens Party and other collaborators being yep. raised, Labor and Liberal colluding to defend the privatisation agenda coalition infighting and the cross-bench bench senators actually taking the leadership. Lisa, I was there in the room. It was an extraordinary hearing. Um, we're going to show a few video clips just to set the scene, though. This really shows you that this issue is heating up. I say to the viewers of this program, you are responsible for this and you must take responsibility for this. It's, this is a grassroots campaign which we've led in the form of providing the, the information that, that showed people the context for the watches and, and th that there was a bigger agenda. We've proven that, right? And now the, 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 the parliamentary process is all over that. And what you've got is the government dug in to try and um, cover their position, right? And they've got this liberal stacked board they were also, that, that was uh, interrogated at the hearing, and they're dug in to cover for the government, right? You had the woman who initiated the whole attack, uh, Kimberly Kitching there on the left of the table. You had this Liberal Senator attack dog sent there, Sarah Henderson, on the right of the table. They were the only disingenuous members of the hearing. In the middle, you had Sarah Hanson Young, which did a good job as the chair, um, a Labor Senator, Kim Carr, is genuinely interested in getting to the bottom of this, and he does a, a great job. Senator Bridget McKenzie did an excellent job, and in, in, not just in interrogating the witnesses, but fighting her coalition colleague, Sarah Henderson, and then Pauline Hanson did some brilliant stuff, which, which we'll show. But let's start off with the big one, because they launched an attack on us, and this time, uh, last time it was Kimberly Kitching attacked me, this time it was Sarah Henderson attacked me. Um, including being astounded that I was even there. So let's play this clip. Uh, uh, look, I just want to um, go to an issue of great concern, one that um, Senator Kitching also raised. You've stated that the LPO group ran a phone campaign aimed at the offices of Ministers Birmingham and Fletcher. Was this coordinated with the Australian Citizens Party? We didn't actually run the campaign. We heard that it was happening and we, like, we were contacted and asked to stop the phone calls. But this is not just LPO. But that was, 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 that, was that run in conjunction with the Australian Citizens Party? No, it, it wasn't. Can I just say that it was not run in conjunction? All right, so with the there is some... Um, can I just, I, I sorry, just want I would to follow like up to just... question to the evidence just given for the sake of um, uh, looking at it. Who called you and asked you to stop? Uh, Senator Fletcher, uh, Mr Fletcher's office. Minister Fletcher's office. Yeah. Okay, Ryan, thank you. Senator Henderson. Thank yeah. you very much, Chair. So the Australian Citizens Party's press release of the 9th of February 2021 quotes extensively from your public statements, repeats your call okay. to reinstate Ms Holgate yes. and, uh, and um, calls for a phone campaign against Ministers Birmingham and Fletcher. Um, the evidence is that you have been working closely with the Australian Citizens Party in your campaign against the government, and you would be aware, Ms Cramp, the controversial foundations of the Australian Citizens Party, formerly known as the Citizens Electoral Council, which is based on the political leader Lyndon LaRouche, some type, someone who is said to be anti-Semitic, a racist and a conspiracy theorist. And I might suggest that somebody said Christine Holgate had breached or misappropriated taxpayers' funds. So can I just you ask you to believe Can I just ask you to answer that question? Okay. We have to a business that relies on the citizens of Australia. I have no understanding and I really don't care what the citizens party represents. They are citizens of Australia. They are aligned with us. They think Australia Post should be offering 
a, a, a postal bank. So that's they fine. Are, so they are aligned with you. In fact, Mr. Barwick, and I think Senator Kitching raised Mr. Barwick uh, in her questioning of Ms. Holgate. Ms. Holgate actually thanked um, Mr. Barwick. Uh, he is associated with the, the Citizens Party, and he's actually in the room. I understand. Yes, I think he's very interested so in could this. So we, could we just understand, right, so he's in the room. He's just made, he's just published a tweet supporting you. Well, that's great. They are supporting us. They are citizens of Australia. Are you saying that the citizens of Australia should not be supporting Australia Post? Now, Liz, it was pretty funny being there for that. And when she was indicating that I was in the room, I'm waving my hand around, etc. We've actually going to make a, have a right of reply to that committee. But let me just make this point. It wasn't really an attack on us. It was an attack on the LPO group, right? And this is where they made a big mistake because Australians love the LPO group. That's why they're behind this issue, right? They are our post officers. And that senator, in order to cover for her boss, turned her fight. We're used to them attacking us. She attacked Angela Cramp and the LPO group. So people should be mad about that. We did, but she, then she resorted to this fake outrage. We're going to play a clip now where you'll see what she says at the end. You'll hear her at the very end att after attacking Angela. Um, and listen to the words she used, and then we contrast it with something that should sound very familiar. Uh, look, I just want to um, go to an issue of great concern, one that um, Senator Kitching also raised. You've stated that the LPO group ran a phone campaign aimed at the offices of Ministers Birmingham and Fletcher. Was this coordinated with the Australian Citizens Party? We are not supporting the Citizens Party. They are supporting us to try and help us save Australia Post from short-sighted political I agree completely with Senator Kitching. This is absolutely shocking. Save us just, from this what's happening with Australia Post and we won't have that we, problem. We are appalled to hear this. Can I ask, can okay, I ask hang two on a questions? second, Senator Kitching? Appalled and disgusted again. Ms Cramp. I was appalled. It's disgraceful. Senator Kitching. Appalled and disgusted again. Ms Cramp. I was appalled. It's disgraceful. Now, the chairman of the board, Lucio Di Bartolomeo, then came under heat again and heated questioning in particular from Senator Pauline Hanson. And I want to show a clip from her grilling him. Um, now, firstly, however, Sarah Henderson had cited two emails written by Christine Holgate in the two or three days after she was thrown under the bus by Prime Minister Scott Morrison on the floor of Parliament. And because they said things like, Rodney, thanks for leading, leading referring to Rodney Boys taking over the CEO position, and also, uh, as I step away from the organisation and let Rodney lead, dot, 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 Sarah Henderson stated it was her belief that it's very clear Ms Holgate did agree to stand aside. Well, Pauline took issue with that, as you'll see, and you'll see his reaction. Are Senator Hanson, given that I was the other party to that conversation, maybe it's relevant to take my... No, it isn't, uh, Mr Bartolomeo, because I'll tell you what, they are at the board meeting. And I am asking the board members these questions, not what you're telling me. I want to hear from the board members. Well, now, from the board, well, members, the board members, they are only taking your word for it. There's no Correct. evidence to show that on that night of the 22nd of October that you actually ha came to an agreement with Christine Holgate. Well, so there I will go back to the board. Thank you very much. the email correspondence, Senator Hanson. Now, in the... Miss West, where are you aware that Mr Tony Nutt was to be in correspondence with Christine Holgate via email and telephone conf um, conference uh, at the same time you have in your board meeting. Were you aware of that? Uh, Senator, what, my recollection of the telephone calls and as, as we've discussed, and as we've discussed already, um, that was in three parts. Uh, during the course of that phone call, um, I was aware that, that, that Mr Nutt was in communication with Ms Holgate um, I understood, this is my personal understanding, that Ms Holgate had reached out to him 
uh, and was seeking his um, or was discussing with him the course of action. Uh, when he came and went from our phone call, I, I don't recall and I've got obviously got no record of that. Um, so, yes, I was aware that there were conversations going on between Mr Nutt and Ms Holgate. Can you please explain to me then, if the chair advises the board, now the meeting went from four o'clock via teleconference from four o'clock till 6.20 when it shut, closed down, is that correct? If it was 6.20? All right. There were why, breaks, then, I, then I want an explanation. Why was Christine Holgate still um, having email um, conversations with Tony Nutt there was one at um, 6.03 p.m. There was one here at 5.49. I have done nothing wrong. I welcome an investigation. I have offered to the chair to take two weeks annual leave to enable an investigation to be conducted promptly. There was another one at um, 6.41. This is after your meeting had closed. She still says in this one, I have done nothing wrong. I welcome an investigation. I have offered to the chair to take annual leave to enable an investigation to be conducted promptly. Why would Christine Holgate be still putting that in an email at 6.41 when your board meeting finished at 6.20 and she still states, I have offered to give annual leave? Who's telling the truth? I can't comment on that. I was, our meeting had completed at that time. Well, I tell you what, I've got the minutes of the meeting here and boy, they look like they're sanitised. And you know, the thing too is these minutes of meetings was drawn up by Mr MacDonald. No secretary, but only the reflection of what the chair told him to put in the minutes. There is no voting, there's nothing. I've actually conducted board meetings myself. There are no mo voting, who voted, how they voted, especially pointing Mr Boys. Now, I don't know how you conduct your meetings. There is no signed document. Where is it signed off by the members of the board? So basically, accepting her letter of resignation was in contradiction of her her contract with you. You should not have terminated it. You weren't, S you Senator, weren't allowed Senator, to because it was six can, months. Senator, can I answer this question? This is uh, uh, information I've already provided at previous, at previous uh, inquiries. What it was that we received a, a letter of resignation from Ms Holgate. She wanted the matter dealt with that day, as you quite rightly expressed. What she wanted was a release from her six months notice of resignation. That's what she was after. It is part of her contract that she was supposed to give six months notice. And we could agree to her request, which we did. We did agree you to her request. You still contravened the contract, Mr Bartolomeo. No, I'm sorry, I'm you contravened the contract. Your evidence doesn't stack up as far as her agreeing to stand down because you never had that personal conversation with her in the afternoon. You did in the morning of the October the 22nd. You never had a personal conversation with her when she was in the car. You did with Sue Davies. The telephone records may show that you rang her number, but you never had a personal conversation with her. You got your... You got your my orders from the Department of the Shareholder Ministers or possibly the Prime Minister himself. That's why you were on this rampage to get rid of her and that's why you would not accept her two weeks annual leave. You had to get her to stand aside because that's what they were requesting. Okay. Uh, thank you, Senator, Senator Hanson. Those statements are not correct. Okay. Uh, and I want it noted for the record. Thank you. Elisa, we focused there on Lucio, the chairman again. The board did. The board was also there. They're the Liberal stack people. The key witness didn't turn up, Tony Nutt, because he was sick. But he's on Monday, right? So there's more fireworks to come. Yeah. Now we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back to discuss Bob Catter's contribution talking about a People's Bank. <laughs> Welcome back to the Citizens Report where we're discussing the fiery proceedings in the Australian Post hearings on Tuesday. Now, um, House of Representatives member, uh, Federal MP Bob Catter asked to testify at the hearing. And so he gave this testimony which we'll show a few clips from. Elisa, Bob was the first politician to put up his hand and defend Christine Holgate because he was the first to recognise that the angle that we raised about banking was probably spot on and he raised it in this testimony. So I would say 
that privatisation has been an absolute disaster. And the loss of our banks, I don't think I have to tell anyone in Australia that we need Commonwealth Bank as a policeman. You've suggested that the problem may well have something to do with the banks um, being concerned about the expansion of Australia's post financial services. Can you, did I understand you correctly? Yeah, very much so. And also, they resented very strongly being forced to come into the agreement, and they were, in my opinion, forced to come into the agreement, because the threat was there that if you don't agree to pay us an acceptable agency fee, then we'll set up our own bank. I mean, that threat was there, and the banks had to give in to that threat, and they didn't like it. That's my opinion. Uh, there's no way I've got to prove it. I haven't got the research staff to do that, Senator, but I think you're well on the track of what happened. Like you, I'm a huge supporter of our licensed post office network around the country, and particularly in rural and regional Australia. And I do note uh, that this was a sector, I think it's fair to say, under threat under Mr Fahua. Uh, so I'm very pleased to see a robust LPO network. But I wanted to ask you about the charge that consumers are paying for bank transactions in post offices. It's, uh, I've had one constituent just contact me a few days ago saying that he had to pay $4.50 per bank transaction. Now, if you're on a low income, that's a lot of money. Uh, have you um, had similar sort of feedback and what's your view about that? Well, you know, if you go to an ATM, I, I think charge is $2.50, but please don't quote me on that. But any bank transaction, they'll charge you transaction fee. And, um, well, you know, the bank is entitled to charge a transaction fee. One of the reasons I'm a, I want to go a people-owned bank is that it stands as a policeman. I mean, if the bank does justify a $4.50, then that's fair enough that they charge it. But is it warranted? I don't think so. Um, but, you know, let because isn't it the, the case market that decide, but let us know and the only way we can ever know is to have a policeman in there, and that policeman is a people-owned bank. So and we know we really whether it's justified or not. Well, there's a Bob Catter's analysis there is spot on. The banking issue is what's been driving this associated with the uh, privatisation issue. And look what Sarah Henderson did compared to what we, the clip we showed earlier. She is so fake. She does not support licensed post offices. She, if she did, she would not have attacked Angela Cramp and the LPO group she, the way she did. She's just there to cover for Scott Morrison's butt in this hearing, but that means that they know it needs to be covered, right? In other words, we are taking a toll, which is good. We're, we're making progress here. And again, I blame or credit the viewers who've been participating in this campaign. Good on you. Um, what we've done though, Elisa, is we've put out a press release accusing the National Party of betraying licensed post offices because they could fix this. Now, one National Party Senator, Bridget McKenzie, has done a brilliant job. It's because of how good a job she's done that she shows up the rest of her colleagues. They're doing nothing. And in fact, one, one the member for Lyon wrote a disgusting email, basically blaming it all on the watches, etc. All this time later, honest people know it's got nothing to do with that. We need people to call National Party MPs. They're the weak link here. They could go as a delegation to Scott Morrison office and demand he fix it. A CEO who protected her services for regional Australia, in fact, expanded them and, and saved Australia Post and licensed post offices in the process, should not have lost, lost her job because of political intrigues. And that's all it was. Nothing to do with watches, just political intrigues. She should, that should not have happened. And when it does happen, it should be reversed. And they can make that happen. Mm. Right? We need people to call them up and hound them and say, you fix this. Mm. Put the heat on before Monday because, as we mentioned, the hearings are back on Monday. Yep. Now, it'll be very interesting to see what comes from a bit of heat being put on to Tony Nutt, but also Lucio. Will he crack this time? Because he Will was... the nut crack or will <laughs> Lucio crack? <laughs> it remains to be seen. Something's going to crack. Now, we'll be right back to discuss um, another issue on the Belt and Road Initiative. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. We're now discussing why Scott Morrison loves China's Belt and Road. So people would be familiar with the fact that the Foreign Minister Maurice Payne on the 21st of April cancelled four Victorian deals with foreign countries under new legislation that's come in 
which uh, allows the federal government to override Victorian agreements, or sorry, state level agreements. Um, now these include two educational agreements with Syria and Iran that are basically dormant in any case, but also importantly two uh, belt and road memorandums that we've agreed to with China. Now, Lisa, the, the government, the federal government and the media are trying to make it sound like these are so clearly part of a threat. Belt and Road is a massive threat to the world, right, that it's unconscionable that the Victorian government should have these things. What they want people to forget is how absolutely not that long ago they loved China, the same federal government loved China and loved the Belt and Road. We're going to play a clip. This is Scott Morrison in 2015. He's talking about an aged care agreement with China. Don't, there's, there's some text on the screen. Ignore that. Look at how enthusiastic he is about the actual issue of China. And look at Tony Abbott, the Prime Minister, gazing up at him in awe at how wonderful an opportunity this is. About the tremendous free trade agreement, the export agreement, the China export agreement, Mr Speaker, which is a visionary document. It's a visionary document, Mr Speaker, because Australia is not alone, not alone when it comes to having an ageing population. Eight and a half per cent of the Chinese population currently is aged over 65. And by 2050, Mr Speaker, almost 24 per cent of the Chinese population will be over the age of 65. Now, that will be actually more than in this country here, Mr Speaker. Now, for those who are aged over 80 in China, Mr Speaker, there is around 23 million now almost the population of this country, and by 2050 it will be more than 90 million. So what a visionary document, a visionary document that put into the agreement that Australian service suppliers can establish profit-making aged care institutions throughout China. Now look, this is two years later, uh, Steve Chobo, the Trade Minister, in 2017, when Belt and Road is being pushed, look at what he says about it and how enthusiastic he was on behalf of the Australian government, the Liberal government. Australia's Trade Minister says China's Belt and Road Initiative will provide a win-win opportunity after attending the summit in Beijing over the last couple of days. Stephen Chobo is heading to Hanoi for the APEC Trade Minister's meeting. He's currently in Hong Kong today and joins us now from there. Minister, great to have you. Of course, win-win is the preferred ter terminology from Beijing. You've said that uh, you want to see the details of this $78 billion infrastructure push. What are you hoping or expecting that Australia might be able to get out of it? Well, Australia's got a great track record with the financing, the design and the construction of infrastructure. I think that there's real opportunity for us to be able to work uh, in a complementary way with this initiative. Um, Australia, of course, has a great relationship with China, especially when it comes to trade. Uh, we've got a lot of knowledge and experience that we can share, so I'm very confident that going forward, uh, Australia will be able to play its role uh, as part of the broader uh, initiative being executed across the uh, various countries and throughout Asia and into Europe. So, Robbie, what changed? US foreign policy is what's changed, right? And this is what's shocking. This is what Australians should be shocked by. This, these, these are, this is not a sovereign decision by us. Mm. This is not our idea. We loved our trade relationship with China, etc. Now, the, C's, the Citizen Party had some criticisms of how it evolved over time, but it is what it is. And we loved it. All these guys were enthusiastic. And now suddenly, because American foreign policy decided to demonise Belt and Road as a threat to them... We've gone along with that. It's not sovereign by Australia at all. No, I mean, DFAT had been consulted during construction of the Victorian Memorandum of Understanding in any case. Scott so Morrison signed his own one that he's keeping secret. As the Treasurer, exactly. he signed his own Belt and Road Agreement. That hasn't been torn up. That's right. Now, you can read more about it. There's an article in the Australian Alert Service, two articles, in fact, so tune in. We've got a cut now uh, for our viewers on Channel 31. We'll see you next week. We'll continue for our YouTube viewers. If you read, Elisa, the, and I think you're going to, the, the other quotes from politicians at the time, including Scott Morrison, you, this is why we called this segment Why Scott Morrison Loves yes. Belt and Road. Yes, so less than two years ago, Scott Morrison declared the infrastructure needs of the Indo-Pacific region are enormous and Australia welcomes the contribution that the Belt and Road Initiative can make to regional infrastructure investment and to regional development. Then the Trade Hang Minister... Hang on, Elisa, that's 2019. Mm. Right? That's, that's uh, almost three years into Trump's presidency, where Trump was the most demonising of this. He's still saying that. Yeah. And then Trade Minister, well, then Trade Minister Simon Birmingham in November 2018 welcomed Victoria's enthusiasm and initiative 
and yeah. welcomes the fact that through the Belt and Road Initiative, China invests more across our region. And Foreign Minister Maurice Payne, who just canned all the deals in November 2018, also declared, we encourage the states and territories <laughs> to expand opportunities with China. And now then what? after the deal was announced, she said, it, she was actually defending uh, criticism, saying it's a matter for Victoria. And on ABC Radio on the 6th November said that the states and territories make arrangements of this nature at this level regularly with other countries in this region and more broadly. But what happened, Elisa, was in 2020... Um, Mike Pompeo, the repulsive American Secretary of State and self-avowed liar, CIA liar, appeared on this on Rupert Murdoch's bizarre Sunday show called Outsiders. And everyone was saying, why is he going on this little show? Well, it was definitely Rupert Murdoch's hand was in this because Rupert Murdoch has used his media power to make sure Australia aligns completely with the United States and the UK on all strategic matters and shows no independence whatsoever. So he goes on there. He's asked about Victoria's Belt and Road and he threatens that if that um, America would cut off uh, sort of, you know, intelligence sharing and all that sort of five eyes mm. garbage um, if it went ahead. And so suddenly these same politicians who expressed that kind of attitude when it happened showed a bit of an independent streak, suddenly went yellow. Right? And they rushed this bill through Parliament where they can scrap it. And it's not even, once they scrapped it, suddenly the press is full, is full of honest analysis of the Belt and Road Memorandum and pointed out it's not binding. Hmm. There's nothing nefarious in it. In fact, it hasn't even been used. It hasn't started yet. It was still under construction of negotiation. It hasn't even been used and there's nothing, to, there's literally nothing to it. Hmm. But this is, such is the nature of the climate that we're in. But... One of the reasons that, extra reasons that we're pretty cranky about this, you know, apart from the fact that as Australians we want our country to be independent, right, stand up on its own two feet on, these, on, on the world stage, like Malcolm Fraser called for in his book Dangerous Allies, we've got all these exporters that have these markets in China. They are being smashed now. And they're being smashed because we're calling it economic coercion. No, China was economically coerced by Trump with that trade deal which they agreed to, $200 billion, and they're buying all those things that our exporters send to them. Trump demanded they buy it. They've stuck, China has stuck with that agreement. But if we're going to go so slavishly in on America's behalf, like Scott Morrison has, China said, well, if we've got to buy it from them, we're not buying it from you. And the Five Eyes claim they've got our back, but a former ambassador, Jeff Raby, said, mm. no, they don't have our back because if, they did have our, did it have, if America did have our back on this, it would not be exporting those items to China that our exporters are losing. Exactly. Right? And this is just, it's such a fake charade that we've allowed ourselves to get sucked into, but it's doing real economic damage out there and people should be upset about it. And I think an exemplary uh, case in point is New Zealand because, and this is covered in also in the Australian Alert Service. It's a great contrast. In detail. Exactly. It's negative proof of the same interference that is coming from the Five Eyes, where we're allowing, because the Five Eyes is the intelligence agencies yes. of those five countries. It's not the governments. It's those intelligence agencies. They're dictating policy, including economic policy. Their remit has expanded into all kinds of areas that you never would have... You Picture know, this. These are guys in brown trench coats whose job is to go to parks and sit next to some stranger in a park and swap a bit of intel. They're naturally paranoid. They're quite bizarre indiv human beings, most of them, right? There's a, they're a kind of, at best, a necessary evil. They are now calling the shots mm. on our foreign policy. That's it. When, when, when Ben Chifley in 1949 was asked by MI6 to set up ASIO, he initially refused. He did not want to turn Australia into a police state. Not only did we get ASIO and a police state apparatus, they're now running our policy and all they're doing is making sure that we lose all the actual in sovereign independent decision making when it comes to foreign policy mm. and align 100% with the, um, the US and UK on their strategy at the moment of, of targeting China, which is leading us to a war. And you've got that um, Secretary of Home Affairs, Mike Pizzullo, actually talked about the, the drumbeat of yeah. war is happening right now, right? These people are, this is, we've been, this, isn't this what we've been warning about, right? We started there first. We said war is the ultimate 
inevitable end of where this is going and we worked our way backwards and people have been saying to me no no what what, what how can you say there's going to be a war mm. they were planning a war right and, and now it's starting to come out mm. and and um we don't have you know we, we, the, the people that are sort of calling the shots in this they just they're just dragging us along behind that agenda and um the ring through our nose at least that's calling that's that's big that through which we're being pulled is called ASPI, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. That's the ring through Australia's nose by which America's pulling us. They're the ones that are making up all these lies about China and our media every day of the week. Um, and we're trying very hard to refute those, debunk those and combat the agenda. Mm. And when the New Zealand Foreign Minister, Nanaya Mahuta, dared to challenge that everything should be done under that Five Eyes matrix on the 19th of April, she explained that uh, we're uncomfortable with the expanding remit of the Five Eyes. She was slammed for that. I mean, the defence editor of the London Telegraph, Con Coughlin, said that due to uh, New Zealand's naive decision to prioritise trade with China over its membership of the elite Five Eyes, Jacinda Ardern can expect her country's isolation to deepen. He talked about New Zealand could be potentially thrown out of the Five Eyes. He said Ardern can expect her pro-human rights credentials to come under closer scrutiny. And you had even Alexander Downer, our former foreign minister, saying, oh, you know, uh, New Zealand dared to upgrade their free trade agreement with China in February while China was imposing sanctions on Australia. Used to be our best mates, he tweeted. Not now. Well, by that standard, then America is our worst enemy because they're the ones that are stealing our markets. Exactly. So, you know, this whole Five Eyes issue has to be put behind the priority of the economic reconstruction of our economies. Um, and Well, the world needs to actually come to a more cooperative model of international relations, right? And everything at the moment is defined by this neoconservative outlook that look in the United States and Britain, which is that the Anglo-American powers must remain number one at all costs. No, at all costs is now includes nuclear war, right? There's no reason for any one country to remain number one, right? We can all get along. This is the 21st century. We don't need to be thinking that of strategic advantage all the time. Let's mm. let's have a more cooperative model. Yeah. And infrastructure development is a good thing on which to cooperate, and that's why makes, that's why Belt and Road yeah. is a positive thing, not a threat. Yeah, which is why you see the opposition to it as, you know, yeah. the the purview of warmongers who like to control things by keeping people and nations divided and splintered. So that's what we aim to stop. We're going to get development back on the agenda, and a people's bank will be the centre stage of that. So join in the campaign, ring the national MPs over the weekend. That's all we've got time for. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for viewing and tune in again next week.